Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. You really didn't mess up anything. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I'm really excited to talk uh, to you about some of the work that I do here at Bigelow. And this is the third time that I gave one of these Cafe Scientifics as I'm working at Bigelow. I gave one last year, and I volunteer again to do it this year. I really like talking about viruses. <laughs> so what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I do in my lab. And when I say I do, I don't mean me on my own. I really work with a wonderful group of collaborators. I have a wonderful research associate working in my lab, Alana Gill. And I also have the privilege of work with a group of really nice uh, undergrad students. Undergrad students come and go, but some of them keep coming back, so they're recurring. And actually, I'm going to present the work of some of my students tonight. And before I in talk any more about viruses, I want to make a disclaimer. I'm a marine virus ecologist. So if you have any questions about Zika virus and things like that, I'm sorry, I'm not your <laughs> to-go guy tonight. I know the basis of virology, but I have to explain clearly. There are a lot of similarities, and there are even many more differences between these marine viruses that we study and, mar and viruses that infect humans. So yes, bear with me. If you have any questions, I'll try my best, but I cannot promise that I will answer properly. So before I even get started telling you more, I wanted to quiz you. I have put up two pictures over here. Does anyone in the audience recognize what we might be looking at? Here on the right-hand side, for example. Andromeda. Sorry? Andromeda. Right. Andromeda. That's Andromeda, yeah. So on the right, we have the universe. And on the left, or sorry, on the right? Algae. 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 Yeah, we have algae, we have viruses, we have bacteria. So what we're looking at here, this is just snapshot of the universe. And here is how a drop of seawater looks under the microscope. We collect the water, we put some fluorescent stain that will bind to the nucleic acids, the genetic information of all living organisms. And then when you put it under the microscope, you excite it with certain light, uh, wavelength, and then it glows, so you can detect. So if we take a closer look at this drop of water, we see some bigger, like, galaxy-looking things. Those are big phytoplankton cells, or relatively big in, compar in comparison with everything else. So these are the microscopic plants that live in the ocean. Then we have, a bit smaller, all those planets floating around. Those are bacteria. There are lots of them in the, in the ocean. And then, much smaller, I didn't even bother putting so many arrows around. All those other little dots over there are viruses. This image is not showing distance. So the smaller dots, it's not that they're farther away from the focus. They're simply a lot smaller. So you can see, roughly, the proportion you have an order of magnitude more bacteria than you have larger phytoplankton cells, and then you have at least another order of magnitude even more viruses and bacteria. So on average, there are one to a hundred million viruses in a teaspoon of seawater. And that applies almost any time of the year, anywhere in the ocean. Of course, there's a range, it's 100 to a million, but roughly that's a good estimate of how many viruses we're going to find if we just go and scoop one teaspoon of seawater. And with that, I'm actually answering the first question of my talk, how many viruses are in a teaspoon? Now you know. It's been estimated, I was showing before that universe image, it's been estimated that there are between 100 to 1,000 billion, uh, billion, is that right? Yeah, million, sorry times more viruses in the ocean than there are stars in the known universe. And viruses can infect everything that is alive. Every living organism, all the way from wells down to bacteria, single cell organisms, everyone that is alive is susceptible to viral infection. And these viral infections tend to be very specific. 
there are some viruses that can cross a species or they can infect several related species, but for the most part, they're very specific for their target host. So today, most of my talk is gonna focus of all these different hosts, I'm focusing mostly on the phytoplankton host, these microscopic plants and bacteria that can do photosynthesis. So these are at the base of the food web, of the oceanic food web. These are organisms, single cell organisms that can take up sunlight and use that uh, light energy to create chemical energy that they need for making their living. So with that, they create organic matter and in doing so, they release oxygen. Yeah, and they do more, a lot more than that. I'm not gonna get into all the details, everything that they do, but if you think of bacteria and phytoplankton, mostly bacteria, all together as a group, they're the best chemists on Earth. They can do basically every single chemical reaction that we know of is performed by bacteria. Not every single bacteria does everything, but as a whole, they will do all the chemical reactions that we know. And in doing so, they can transform organic nutrients into inorganic and move things around, change the form of these compounds so other organisms can benefit from them. But like I said, these are single cell organisms, mostly invisible to the naked eye. So what's the relevance? The relevance comes very appearing, uh, appealing when we consider are their global scale and distribution. What we're seeing here is two images, satellite images, pictures of the ocean. You can see around the poles mostly and then around the continental shelves, the warmer colors, reds and greens and yellows, that's showing a higher abundance of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is the pigment that these plants, any plant, the main pigment that they use for catching sunlight. So we can see that from satellite and then you can estimate how much biomass, how much phytoplankton is in that water. So those colors are really large concentrations of phytoplankton. When the right conditions happen in the ocean, the right amount of light, nutrients, temperature, these organisms, this phytoplankton can grow in large amounts and they accumulate in the ocean and that's the result of what we see here. We call those blooms. Like I said before, every single cell, when they're producing photosynthesis, they're releasing oxygen. So if you think at the scale of those blooms that I was showing around the ocean, and every single day of the year, there's a bloom of phytoplankton happening somewhere in the ocean. So that's why how much oxygen they produce, that half of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean and it comes from phytoplankton in particular. Uh, how do viruses work and what do they do to all these hosts that we're talking about, all these organisms? Well, when a virus finds the right host, like I said before, they tend to be specific, they have a way to either get inside or somehow put their genetic information inside the host, which is what is represented here. So their DNA or RNA gets inside. Once inside the cell that is a suitable host, that DNA will take up the host metabolic machinery and it will convince the host to stop making things for themselves and start producing for the viruses. So the viruses can start making a lot of copies of themselves. They completely hijack the cell. They make copies of themselves. Eventually, they kill the cell. They release a lot of progeny. When I say a lot, some of these viruses are capable of producing from one single virus. And in fact, you can get up to a thousand daughters or sons coming out of an infected cell. And then they go out in the ocean, and that's what we were seeing in that image that I showed at the beginning. All those free viruses floating around, waiting from the right host, for the right host to be found. And in doing so, viruses are releasing all the goodies that were inside the cell. So they release organic matter, they release a lot of compounds that were inside the cell. 
they release nutrients that become available for others around them. And of course, in doing so, they're causing mortality, they're controlling populations. If you can think of some phytoplankton species being very efficient growers in the ocean, it could be like the weeds in your garden. Viruses are basically the weeders. So you're, they're pulling the fast growers so others can also use up the available resources around and then you have this balanced ecosystem and equilibrium of an ecosystem. But that's viruses in general. But I keep saying they tend to be specific. So it does matter not just what viruses do, but what each virus does to its host. And different viruses behave differently and different hosts will react, react differently to viral infection. One example of an important phytoplankton is this group of phytoplankton over here, these microscopic cells. They form a chalk shell around them. They have all these little plate-looking things that are made of chalk, calcium carbonate. They cover the cells. So when they're taking CO2 from the atmosphere to their photosynthesis, they also take extra carbon to precipitate it into an organic carbon and make that chalk. This species in particular, that's Emiliana Haxleyi, which is the most abundant of all these coccolithophore species, form large blooms that we can also see from the ocean. They're very distinct because they give this milky, turquoise discolor, discoloration to the woods. And this is just off the coast of Norway, where I did part of my PhD, investigating actually the viruses that infect these guys. It's been well established now that those large blooms that can take up hundreds of square kilometers in the ocean can be terminated within a few weeks to a couple of weeks by viral infection. So we grow these uh, microscopic plants in the lab and we can grow them in whatever volume we want, we can grow them in large densities and we can isolate viruses that are specific from them from the marine environment. So when in the lab we take two cultures, one of them we keep and treat it, that will be our control. And if we take another healthy culture and we add the viruses that we isolated, in a matter of a few days, this is all that is left. The algae is gone, all that we have is this whitish power here, which is the chalk that I was talking about. And all that will sink out. And if you think, this is just a little cartoon of the cell being infected and releasing the viruses. And if you think of that, in the scale of these large blooms that I was talking about, and happening over geological periods, time after time, over large regions of the ocean, like for example in the English Channel, all that sedimentation, all that chalk, is what ended up forming the very famous cliffs of Dover. So all that is chalk from this phytoplankton accumulated over years and then sea level changing and there you have the white cliffs. And like I said before, one very important thing, one very important aspect of phytoplankton is that they are the base of the food web. So if you think this cartoon here, we have phytoplankton. They're the primary producers. And within phytoplankton, I'm including bacteria that can photosynthesize. So you have those guys taking up inorganic nutrients from the environment, taking sunlight, making biomass, so growing and they become food for small animals that like to eat on them. Some of these are single cell organisms, some others like this little copepod are tiny crustaceans, like one milliliter big. And they also become food for fish fry. But typically, there are like this avenue, these guys then will be eaten by bigger fish. So you have all that going from phytoplankton, scaling up, the bigger it's the bigger, and uh, the bigger it's the smaller, and so on. All the way to the big predators. And then you have bacteria. Everything that dies is decomposed by bacteria, and that bacteria will release, and that decomposition will release nutrients back to fuel the growth of phytoplankton. But viral infection can shift this balance. All those trophic levels can be infected by viruses. 
And what that's doing is moving organic matter into the soft pool. So rather than going up the food web, it's utilized by bacteria, which remineralizes, so it decomposes and make it back into nutrients. So viral infection, what we call the viral shunt, is diverting a lot of those nutrients in the ocean to maintain it within the microbial world. And so now I'd like to move. All that it, I've been talking about now is not my own work. I've done some of the research with these species. I have done, but mostly what I'm talking is just common knowledge that we have, things that we know about viruses in the ocean, how they work, just based on evidence that we have accumulated through years of research in this topic. One other thing that I didn't talk about is that viruses also affect evolution. So when they go in and out hosts, they're moving genes from one host to another, from the host to the virus itself, from the virus to the host. So that pushes evolution, but it also pushes evolution in the sense that it will create this arms race for the host, the phytoplankton, the bacteria, or even other unicellular organisms to try to evade in infection. So it's selecting for the fittest that will be resistant to infection. But at the same time, that's also pushing the evolution of the viruses to maintain the ability to keep infecting. And with all that, I would like to take like a couple of minutes pause here in case anyone has some questions about the basics of viral ecology in the ocean before I start talking about more of the specifics of things that we have been doing in my lab. Yes, please. That's a very good question. The question is, what exactly is a virus? Is a virus a cell? Is a virus a living organism or something like that? Uh, I was trying not, of course, many of you were not here last year when I gave my talks. I was trying to do different things. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Viruses per se are not living. They're not alive. A virus, it's nothing more than a package made of proteins. Sometimes they have some lipids around them. And inside, there's genetic material. There are genes in the form of RNA, DNA, double or single strand. So it comes in a lot of flavors, but it's just genetic material wrapped in a package. Now, you can think of them as a seed or a spore. They're not doing anything until they're fertilized, or in this case, until they get inside the right host, the one that they can use their machinery. And then in that moment, we talk about virus life, which could be the infected cell. Because when a virus is infecting a cell, the cell behaves different than a sister cell that is not infected. They really change their chemistry, they change their behavior, so viral infection really affects life. But yeah, that's a good question, yes. How long are these viral cells viable? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat? How long are they viable? How long the cells are viable once they get infected? It changes. There's a, very big range of uh, the infection strategy. You have what I was showing, the virus comes inside and infects. Typical for a lot of bacteria viruses, which we call phages, they're quick. Within a few hours, they start replicating the lysis cell and you get thousands of them. But for some other, in this unicellular organism, especially when we're talking about eukaryotic phytoplankton, so like, uh, cells with nucleus and everything. It's more a matter of uh, 12 to 24 hours before the first few viruses are infected. But I'm gonna be talking a little bit later, actually. That was most of the knowledge that we had from viruses was from these viruses that came, kill the cell, and release themselves. But there's also another strategy where the virus comes inside a cell and integrates its genetic material with the genetic material of the cell and then just goes dormant. And that can last generations. Every time that a cell divides, it will replicate the genome of the virus itself. And there are some environmental triggers, and we understand some of them, we don't know all the others, that will make that strategy to revert into a lytic infection where quickly they go and release. So 
there's a broader broad. How does the, the, the virus navigate to find the host that's All that we know because these are not alive, they don't have any motion, it's all by chance. And that's why they're like our strategies, like you know, K strategies and R strategies. So they produce large progenies and they release the environment. So they increase their chances of random encounter with the right host. So there are receptors on the membrane of the host and also on the capsid of the viruses. And when those receptors are right, they match, then it will be infection. And that's a bit simplistic because sometimes it can attach, it can inject the genetic material inside and it still it won't replicate because you have like something between susceptible and receptible. But yeah, so it's, it's by chance. So the question is if the number of viruses are increasing in seawater, there are like the number that I gave before, one to 100 million, it changes and changes geographically and it changes temporally. So when you, there will be more viruses when there are more hosts. In the winter, in these latitudes, when there's little light, the water is cold, the conditions are not quite right for the host to accumulate in large quantities, viruses don't encounter their hosts at the same rate, so there will be less. Then you have the spring when the phytoplankton start blooming and then viruses will propagate faster. We have looked into the effect of climate change in viral propagation and interaction with hosts and it doesn't seem to be any clear patterns in there. We cannot say, certainly climate change is affecting different hosts, but it's affecting different hosts differently. There are winners and losers. So the overall number of viruses doesn't seem to be affected. In the back. Yeah, they don't have motility. So if there's a balance between organic phytoplankton or sea plankton and then if viruses overwhelm the population, the population dies, and there are all these viruses there with nothing to replicate, I assume they would sink down and become part of the sedimentary layers. Yep. Uh, So the question was, once the viruses infect the host and terminate these blooms, there are not the right hosts around anymore, so what happened to the viruses? Do they sink out of the water column? Do they accumulate in the sediments? And can we track them in the sediment column? And the answer is yes. There's been some, I'm thinking of one particular study, there are several. So viruses, when they are in the water column outside their host cells, they decay very fast. Temperature can damage them. UV light can damage them. So they tend to aggregate with organic matter particles and they sink out. When they're in the cold environment, they seem to be more resilient. They stay longer. And then sometimes you have turbulence that bring them back to a water column when the right host is in there. But there's a study from the Dead Sea, or no, that's not true, the Black Sea where they did some coring of sediments and they went back to 7,000 years ago and they could detect, and that was a particular study for this coccolithophore species and their viruses, they went back 7,000 years in time and they could detect viruses that were there and they could match them with the right host. And the interesting thing is they were able to revive some of those viruses. Actually, they remained viable when they were in the sediment at few meters below the sea level. They're not alive. They're not alive. There's a lot of controversy whether you call them or not alive. I think it just becomes a little bit to semantics. Where do they come from? Where, where viruses come from? That's a very good question. And we don't know very well. The most supported theory about this is that viruses were always there. They probably were what gave rise to life. So in the primordial soup that was the earth before we know the earth the way it is, it seems to be that there were what they call the RNA world. So there were these molecules, this genetic material, RNA type, that were able to self-replicate. 
they didn't have mitochondria, they didn't have ribosomes, and still they self-replicate. So one theory is that that is what eventually gave rise to viruses. Another theory is that cells started to become parasitic of others, and by becoming parasitic, they didn't need to keep carrying their own metabolic machinery. So through evolution, they lost all that, and then they just became dependent on other cells. But it's not very clear. What is clear, we don't have fossils of viruses, but there's evidence of viral infection in fossil organisms. We don't know. There was. Then they die. Where yes. Did the others come from? If you mean now, yeah. well, when that's it's a very good question. So if the host dies and there are no more hosts, where they come from? There are always some resistant cells within phytoplankton population. And phytoplankton, in particular, has evolved uh, strategies for avoid that, avoiding that. There are some that when Phytoplankton can be diploid or haploid, and I'm not going to get into all that, but they have different forms. So actually, we know that the diploid form of the phytoplankton is susceptible to infection. The haploid is not. So, and the viral infection, there are chemical cues, chemical releases into the environment that seem to give the signal to the rest of the population to say, hey, change your strategy of life, become resistant. So there's always a relatively small portion of population that can resist infection. And then viruses will sink out or will be decaying from sunlight or whatever. A few of them will survive, and that's another thing we're not entirely sure where. Maybe some of them are in the sediment and they get resuspended with big storms or so. So when the host doesn't feel the pressure of the virus, grows again, one single virus comes in, and that's all you need to start pro so propagating. <laughs> they're not alive, but they're immortal. Maybe you can, yeah, I never thought of them like that. That's a very good point. Kirsten. So the question is, there are so many viruses, how much biomass, how much they weigh in total? And if there is so much, is someone benefiting from them? Is someone eating them? So these are estimates. When I talk about one to 100 million viruses in a teaspoon, that's standing stock. But there is constantly like new viruses being produced, viruses decaying. But that's, so if you could at one time point gather all those viruses. We know how big a virus is. We know the average. Different viruses come in different sizes, but you can get an average. This is all mathematical estimates. If you could gather all of them at one time point, they would weigh as much as 50 million blue whales. That's the estimate. If you could line them one after another, you could get far as 10 galaxies or something like that. There are a lot of them, and there's a lot of biomass. And indeed, there are some organisms out there that can benefit from eating them directly. These guys are full of phosphorus, nitrogen. It's nucleic acid. That's phosphorus and nitrogen. That's the nutrients that we give to plants and everything. Some of them have lipids around them, so fats that are very nutritional. We know there are virivores, so those that fit on viruses. It's not very well understood who exactly they are. And it's funny, I have a project where we're trying to investigate that precisely. <laughs> we're feeding viruses to a microbial community that we isolated from down our dock. And we're just putting them there, giving them time, and then we're sampling throughout time to see how many viruses disappear. We're labeling the viruses with radioactive and uh, non-radioactive isotopes, stable isotopes, so we can trace them back into their hosts but I don't have any results to show about that yet. So next year. <laughs> so, and I think with that, I'll keep going with the rest of my talk. And then if there are some more questions afterwards, I'll be happy to keep answering questions. So going back to this basic oceanic food web, like I said, it's very easy. This is very simplified. These guys eat the phytoplankton, bigger ones eat them, everything gets remineralized, 
and viruses short circuit this. But it's not that simple. We in the lab are investigating, this is just a picture of one of those blooms of phytoplankton that I was showing before, and I just put there like a little cell cartoon with the viruses. So we chose this one species, Emiliana Huxleyi, the most abundant coccolith of four. These guys with the chalk plates around them. And then we chose a single cell grazer, so a one cell organism that enjoys fitting on this phytoplankton species. And then I got a student working on that in the lab. So what Andrew was doing in the lab, he was growing phytoplankton, this Emiliana Huxleyi, in separate flasks. Half of the flasks received viral uh, stocks and the others didn't. And then he was feeding both of them before there were slices, before the cells were killed, just like a couple of hours after the infection. He was feeding those phytoplankton to this little predator. And then what he saw was a really interesting result, which we're just about to submit for publication. So here in gray, you have uh, those, I forgot to put the legend, but that's representing non-infected phytoplankton cells, so healthy cells. And in black are the results from the infected cells. So when he fed those infected and non-infected separately to the grazers, the grazers were eating more of the healthy phytoplankton. They didn't like, apparently, when the phytoplankton was infected. So they, were, they stopped eating. They ate a little bit, and then they stopped. But then he also measured how fast the, the grazer, the predator, was dividing and growing. And he saw that actually the ones that were eating less of the infected cells were growing significantly faster than the ones that were feeding healthy phytoplankton. So this time, viruses were not diverting all the organic matter, all the nutrients to the microbial loop, but they were actually making more of the intermediate step that then becomes food for the larger ones. So in this time, viruses seems to be pushing the food web in a different direction. And that is before the cells were lysed. So the grazers could tell apart and could benefit from that. We haven't managed to pinpoint what's the mechanism behind. We know that during infection, the cells are chemi chemically very distinct from non-infected cells. We know it changes the composition of their fatty acids, their oils. So it seems like it creates oils with shorter, during infection, the oils in the cells become shorter chain, so they're probably easier to digest by the predator, so they can benefit more. It's like cells, if you will, is half digested for them. So when they feed them less of those, give them better growth. And then, of course, there's less energy consumption going around eating. You sit a little bit, you feel satisfied, you divide fast. If you imagine that happening in one of these huge blooms where you have at one time point of the bloom most of the cells been infected, that's a wonderful food source for these little creatures out there. So the implications can be really large. We need to wrap this up a little bit and then start using mathematics and modeling to really try to figure out the extent. One caveat is, this is just one phytoplankton species, one virus, one predator. We don't know how generalized that is in the environment. That would be the next step. See, is this a common uh, thing that happens in the ocean, or is it not? And another thing, if you see here, I was showing like experiment two, three, four, and experiment one, he only managed to measure the grazing rate, but not the growth rate. So Andrew repeated this over and over, independent experiments, to confirm that what he was measuring was not the exception, but the norm. So he did a very thorough job on that. And with that, I'm going to change completely gears. Bibles. Clams, oysters, very popular around Maine. So 
Bivalves in, gener in general, they are very important from an environmental and ecolo ecological point of view. They are filter feeders, so when they're feeding filter in water, they're removing nitrogen and particulate compounds from the water, so they improve the quality of the water. They can also grow in large masses, forming reefs that support, they become the niche, the environment for other organisms. And of course, we feed on them. They're supporting a very big economy, coastal economy, not only in Maine, but throughout the world. But in Maine in particular, it's an important one. There we have a guy collecting clams in the mud. This is an oyster farm. And it's actually a local one. That's the, a picture from Pemaquid Oyster Farm that I got in the internet. So the other thing is this project that I'm going to talk about is also kind of new. And that's what I thought it was interesting to talk. It's very fresh. So I don't have all the results out there yet. But again, the implications, I think they can be very strong. So oysters and clams, they're suffering from overfishing. They also get infected particular oysters, the Pacific oyster, which is not the one that we have here, can be infected by a herpes virus, but that's not the virus that I'm interested in. And then oysters and clams can also be infected by two types of protozoan parasites. Protozoan parasites are like pro-animals, before animal, like little heterotrophic organisms, single cell organisms that they feed on others. They don't produce their own uh, organic matter. And in particular, here, Jose Antonio, my collaborator, and I on this project are interested in this one parasite called Perkinsis species, which is causative of what we know as dermal disease. So dermal disease is this disease that oysters get. There are cells of Perkinsis, a type of cell called trophozoi, that are floating in the water, and they get ingested by the bivalve during fi filter feeding. Once inside the oyster, it gets into the tissue and it starts propagating fast and digests the tissue of the oyster. So eventually the oyster dies or can die. And new cells are released into the water through feces and when the tissue of the oyster is decayed. And then it goes through another life cycle in the environment and out in the water. And again, those trophozoites are formed again in large quantities, and they can be taken out by another oyster. So this is not so far a big problem in Maine, but it's been a big problem for the oyster aquaculture throughout the world and in many parts of the states. Because when there is a high infection, a high level of these parasites, they can be mass die off of the oysters, and of course, that comes with a big economical uh, impact. So why do we focus on Maine? Although I said in Maine, it has not been a significant problem so much. Jose Antonio and his student, Nick Marquis, a couple of years ago, they did this survey throughout the coast of Maine. They selected 10 different sites, and they went and study oysters from all those sites. And they found that between half and three quarters of the oysters and all those 10 sites throughout the coast of Maine, and this was during a summer period, it was not a longer time, but so half to three quarters of the oyster had the parasite. And that's significant when you think that the previous survey of this kind done in the coast of Maine was in 2002, also by Jose Antonio, and at that time, 12 years before, only 1% of the oysters that they analyzed contained the Perkinsis. So we haven't had any mass die-offs or anything like that. But it seems that this parasite is becoming more prevalent and more ubiquitous along the coast of Maine. So we thought this is a time where we really need to understand the ecology of the parasite. We need to be proactive rather than reactive before we have any significant impact. It will be a good thing if we know what's going on. So one interesting thing of this parasite is one of the few protozoan parasites and the only one of bivalves that we can grow in the lab if, in the absence of the host. So you don't need to have the oysters in the lab. You can just 
add some media, and these parasites, those are the cells of the parasites, they will divide fast. You can get large quantities of them in the lab without having to have oysters. So you can keep everything very contained, and there's not a risk that we're moving things around back and forth into the environment. And we have, there are a number of uh, strains or types of these Perkinsus species in, in culture. We have 11 of them in the lab. Here I'm showing pictures of a couple of them. This one has been found in oysters. This one is from clams. So again, we don't understand why sometimes this Perkinsus parasite can kill a lot of oysters and why sometimes it doesn't. There are different factors that we know affect the virulence, so how bad, how harmful the parasite is. Like, for example, the type of cells. I was showing before that there are different types of cells in the life cycle of the parasite. Some of the cells seem to be more damaging than others. Also, different strains, different type of the parasite might have different defense mechanisms against the immune system, the defenses of the host. So if you're well equipped, if you have the right genes, you might avoid the defenses from the host. And they also have genes that allow them to break up, digest the tissue of the oyster. Again, different strains might have different abilities to do so. But it's all a bit vague. We don't know exactly what's going on. And what is new? So we know all that. We know they're spreading. We know they, are vir different. they have different virulence factors that affect them. But viruses are new, or maybe they're not so new. Because Antonio and I were chatting once. He was showing me these images that he took of one of his Perkinsus culture many years ago. I don't know how many years ago, but a number of years ago, when he was trying to isolate it from oysters in the environment. They cut thin section of the parasite of the Perkinsus cells, and then they look at them in, the, in a very powerful microscope. And they found this virus-looking particles. So VLP stands for virus-like particle. And they thought it was interesting, but that was it. There was no time to do any further investigation. So when I looked at those, seeing viruses, of course I was interested. And it happened that Jose Antonio still maintained that one strain in culture in the lab. So we decided to repeat. Collect the parasites, cut them in very thin sections and put them under the microscope. And voila, we still found that they contain those viruses. So at first when I saw the viruses, I thought, oh, this is the cure. We can infect the parasite, we can kill it. And then the oysters will be healthy. But certainly, they're coexisting, they're not dying with the virus. So what is the virus doing with the host? Even before Jose Antonio had seen those virus-like particles in his Perkinsus isolate, uh, scientists from Portugal had shown that this one Perkinsus isolate from a clam also had virus particles inside them. And we don't have the same strain, we don't have the very same isolate, but we have another isolate of the same species called Perkinsus olsenii. And when we looked at it in the lab, here we have a cell dividing, so each one of these is a daughter cell dividing within one cell. And we noticed that one of those daughter cells looked a bit weird. We took a closer, a closer look, and indeed we found the viruses were there as well. So it seems that these viruses are associated with the Perkinsus parasites that we have in culture. We don't know yet if they're prevalent in the environment as well. We know they seem to coexist. And this is years in culture, and they're not killing the parasite. The parasite grows really well, and this is outside the oyster. So we wanted to know, what are they doing? Before we talk about this lytic infection, the virus comes and quickly infects everything, kills it out. But there's also this persistent infection where the viruses I were experiencing before, the virus gets in the host and doesn't kill the host right away. So it can either put its genomic material, represented here by red, into the genomic material of the cell, or it just produces a few viruses at a time, but slowly, so the host can still keep dividing. 
So that's persistent, but that doesn't mean that it's silent infection. Like I said before, during infection, cells behave differently. It changes the behavior and the metabolism and the chemistry of the infected cells. So what is the relevance of these viruses in Parkinson's? We still don't know, but we really wonder. It happened that there are similar protozoan parasites, closely related. They don't infect oysters. They infect humans. Trichomonas, which is a, a parasite that is transmitted by sexual contact or sexual transmission. Bishmania, which causes skin ulcers. Plasmodium, which is a causative of malaria. All those protozoan parasites that are genetically related to our Parkinson's carry viruses inside them. And some studies have shown that the virus that they carry is not infectious for the humans, but it makes the impact of the parasite worse to a human. When the parasites are infected by the viruses, the parasites are more resistant to treatment, and they cause a bigger inflammatory reaction in the human trying to get rid of them. The immune system responds with an inflammation, and that inflammation, rather than getting rid of the parasite when it's infected with virus, becomes so bad that it's detrimental and it can cause more harm than benefit. So we don't know, but we wonder if the Parkinson's been infected with viruses might also have that kind of, are those species of Parkinson's infected worse or are they less harmful to the uh, oyster, oysters? And that's what we're trying to investigate in the lab. The first step, we are trying to isolate these viruses that we've seen in the microscope. We want to isolate them and study them. We want to know how they look like, what's their genetic material looks like, what's their functional capacity or capability, what, what are they capable of doing? So like I said, we can grow these guys in flasks, we can take, a, this is a 50 milliliter volume, like something like this, we can spin it, harvest all the cells at the bottom, break them physically, and put it through a filter, so we keep only the very little things that were from inside the cell. And then we can put them into what we call a gradient density. So it's like a thick uh, liquid that has different layers of different density. We put our lysate on the top, our viral extract on the top. We spin it for 24 hours. And then all those particles will migrate through that column and stop when they reach the right buoyancy of the environment. And then we can go with a needle and separate all those bands. And that's what we have done. We are sending these samples for sequencing. We will get soon some information about their genetic makeup. So far, what we know, or we think we know, I always get cautious when I say we know until we really have final proofs. They appear to be viral uh, RNA viruses. So they seem to have RNA instead of DNA inside them, which is not uncommon. That's very common. But that's as far as what we know. So in the future, we're going to get these viruses. We have taken some of those bands in there to analyze them again under a very powerful microscope to really verify that what we're seeing is the viruses. We're going to start testing other Parkinson's species that we have in the lab that might not contain the virus to see if we can propagate the virus in them. And that way, we can bring it in the lab in a very secure environment and start investigating how they interact. And of course, the ultimate potential that we're looking for is either to be able to design new uh, therapies or management strategies. Again, are the Parkinson's in Maine not infected by the viruses and that's why they're not killing all the oysters around there? That will also tell us if we know what the effect of viruses is, it will help us in forming like how we prevent moving certain things around or if they are beneficial to the oysters, should we, can we introduce them into the environment so they protect our oysters? One way or another, it's to be determined, but ultimately, one way or another, we're hoping to understand better the impact of this par the virus on the parasite and how that will benefit or damage the oysters, and for the same thing, the clams. 
And with that, I would like to finish. And just, I would be happy if after all this talking and talking, you go home remembering that marine viruses are very abundant and they're genetically very diverse. They're planetary forces. They're not just affecting one cell at a time, but all together they're affecting the planet and the oceans. They're not only detrimental, they also have some benefits for the ecology and even for ourselves. So we can hopefully start applying some of these viruses. We're already applying many viruses in substituting antibiotics for targeting specific harmful bacteria. So there's always a potential on viruses. And with that, if there are any more questions, I would be happy to answer them. So the question is, that study that I was showing from Andrew, where he was feeding the literal predators, infected and uninfected hosts, what's, how is that going to change if the temperature of the water is increasing? We haven't got that far. So like I said, at the moment, we know that's happening in the lab. We would have to investigate it under more environmentally relevant conditions. We grow our organisms under the same light or mimicking the light and temperature and nutrient conditions that they would find in the environment. But another thing that is very important is to see if you offer a mixture of food to the predator, will they then go and choose? Because in the environment, there are many things happening together. So, yeah. Well, wow. other questions? How many oysters do you need to save to eat before you start putting the salt and pepper? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question for Jose Antonio. Jose Antonio always say, I still love eating oysters. So the thing is, neither, as far as we know, neither the parasite nor the virus are harmful to humans. They kill the oyster, and you don't want to eat an oyster that is decaying and rotten. That's probably not very pleasant. But the parasite itself won't do any harm to you. How do oysters die if they're not infected? How do they die if they're not infected? Seagulls will eat them. And <laughs> they get old. They get other diseases. There are other, I showed before, there's a number of all the things that might impact them. This is just one of them. Other questions? Okay, let's thank Jose. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.